Hi, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to the Posit Enterprise Community Meetup. If you just join now, feel free to say hi through the chat window and maybe where you're calling in from. I also like to say, if you want to connect with each other in the chat, that's all for you too. So feel free to use the chat to meet other people who are joining us today as well. Special welcome to those joining us for their first time today. This is a friendly and open meetup environment for teams to share use cases, teach lessons learned, and just meet each other and ask questions. These happen on Tuesdays at 12 Eastern time, not every single Tuesday, but we do have a community event calendar, which I'll share in the chat in just a second here. You can also use the link sh uh, shared on the screen here too. Together, we're all dedicated to making this space inclusive and open for everybody, no matter your experience, industry, or background. So, uh, during the event, We'd love to hear what questions you have as well, so you're able to ask questions on YouTube Live and also anonymously through Slido, uh, which I will share on the screen in just a second here as well, link, and I'll put it in the chat. To address one common question up front, yes, the recording will be available, and it will actually be ready right away, like immediately as the presentation ends at the same exact YouTube Live link. At one of the recent data science hangouts, which happened on Thursdays at noon Eastern time, I was able to get a little bit of a view into the amazing work the team at Unity Health Toronto is doing to bring predictive analysis to different clinical problems and resource problems in the hospital. And I'm so excited to be able to dive into that deeper today with Chloe Pupron. Chloe is a data scientist with the data science and advanced analytics team at Unity Health Toronto. Their team uses high quality healthcare data in innovative ways to catalyze communities of data users and decision makers in making transformative changes that improve patient outcomes and healthcare system efficiency. So I'd love to bring Chloe up here on stage with me, our virtual stage here. Thanks so much for joining us, Chloe. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Rachel, and thank you all for joining. Um, I'm really excited to be talking about tools and insights for developing and uh, deploying algorithms in the hospital. Um, so actually, as I was developing the slides, there were a few alternate titles that I had considered. Um, another one that I had considered was this one right here, uh, which is how we got our model out of one person's computer and deployed it to the hospital. Uh, which I think is an apt description of uh, the things I'll be talking about for the next hour or so. Um, yeah, so I guess um, for uh, the next while, um, I'll spend a bit of time going over uh, DSAA, who we are, what we do, uh, where we started versus where we are now, and really just diving into the main content of the talk, which is what are the things that you need for development um, and what are the things that you need for deployment. And all of this, of course, is in the context of uh, working in the hospital, working in the healthcare setting. Um, yeah, so hi everyone, uh, I'm Chloe and I'm a data scientist for the DSAA team at Unity Health Toronto. Um, so DSAA, or rather the Data Science and Advanced Analytics, um, is a healthcare data analytics group at Unity Health Toronto, also known as UHT. Um, throughout the slides, there are a few acronyms. Um, I'll try my best to expand them. I think acronyms might be like a data science thing or maybe a hospital thing. Anyways, I'll try my best to expand all of them. Um, so yeah, so basically DSAA's aim is really to work with hospital, work with our collaborators and also our partners to make better decisions, increase hospital efficiency and improve patient care and patient outcomes. Um, so in particular, because we're working in the hospital, the projects that we work on will require process and change management. Um, so that's why we work directly with clinicians and with administrative decision makers to develop and deploy our solutions. Um, now, what kind of solutions do we work on? A little, bit of, a little bit of everything. So we have solutions that will rely on statistics, some that focus more on artificial intelligence, some on machine learning, some on optimization, like operations research, for example. Currently, we have more than 40 active solutions at Unity Health Toronto, 
And these are, for example, solutions for uh, predicting patient outcomes for enhanced clinical management, uh, planning for hospital bed capacity. We have some medical imaging AI tools. And we also have some solutions for assignment and scheduling. Um, here is an example of some of the things that we've worked on. So right here, I have a screenshot of our COVID dashboard. Um, so here, what we're reporting are the counts of people who are COVID positive, people who have been exposed to COVID, as well as people who previously had COVID and are now recovering. Um, and um, in this case, we're, we're um, showing the counts for the three different uh, sites uh, that make up our hospital network. Um, so Unity Health Toronto uh, is based in the Greater Toronto Area, and um, it is made up of three different hospitals. So we're showing the, um, the numbers for those three hospitals. Here we have an example of um, our wharf dosing tool. So this is an application for calculating the wharf and dose based on various input features. Um, so warfarin is a medication, so it's a blood thinner, and um, we're calculating uh, the dosing based off different input features. And then we have our emergency department forecasting tool. Um, so here we're uh, counting the number of um, um, patients that are arriving to the ED. Um, so on the right hand side, you can see we have our uh, forecasted numbers. Uh, and we're also reporting the historical numbers. So you can get a sense of how well the model is doing. Um, so who are the people that work uh, within the Data Science and Advanced Analytics group? Um, so our team is actually made up of uh, four different teams. So we have the data integration and governance team. So they are the ones who will take the data and will um, you know, um, connect to the database, um, uh, transform the data in a way that is uh, amenable for data science. And then we have the advanced analytics team. Um, so they are the ones who are taking the data and building a model on top of it. And next we have the product development team. So they're the ones who are deploying the model. Um, so they're also the ones that are handling any kind of like downstream integrations. So for example, if we have a model that is supposed to send a push notification, the product development team uh, will be the ones who are taking care of that. And finally, we have the support team who are really uh, the glue that hold everything together. Um, so they're the ones who take care of project man management and coordination at both an internal and external level. Um, so because we're collaborating with lots of different groups within the hospital, um, this is where we're having the support team is really helpful. Um, okay, so I briefly talked about some of the different solutions that we worked on. Um, I want to uh, kind of like dive in and focus on one solution in particular, which is a successful deployment uh, known as ChartWatch. Um, so in August 2020, we deployed ChartWatch, which is an early warning system for detecting patient deterioration. Um, so, so it's been running since August 2020, and to this day, it's still running in the hospital. Um, ChartWatch was deployed to the general internal medicine ward um, within the hospital. Um, I guess as an aside, why is it called ChartWatch? Um, really, it's a, it's a branding thing. So before becoming known as DSAA, we were actually known as Chart, which is a center for healthcare analytics research and training. Um, so one thing you may notice uh, throughout the talk is like, I do mention a thing known as Chart, um, and it's really for uh, because of who we were initially known as. Um, so yeah, so we developed ChartWatch. It's an early warning system, and uh, really it's a model that predicts which patients are at risk of deterioration. Um, so what I mean by deterioration is any of the following. So either transfer to the intensive care unit or the ICU, death in the hospital, or transfer to the palliative care unit. So the way that the chart watch model was trained is it was trained on about 20,000 uh, patient visits. Um, and these data consisted in laboratory values, vital measurements, and demographics. Uh, so these are all things that you would typically find in an electronic health record. And the way the model works is it outputs a risk group. Uh, so for every patient, we would generate a risk group. Uh, so the patient will be classified as either being high risk versus medium risk versus low risk. And then these risk groups are then delivered to different end users. Uh, and we have different methods of delivery based on who uh, the predictions are going out to. 
Uh, so for example, we have emails. These are sent to our charge nurses, our palliative care team. And uh, what these emails contain is basically a list of patients with their uh, risk group listed. Uh, so if you look at the column, uh, the third column from the right, you'll see the, the chart watch risk groups are included here. Um, another uh, method of delivery is updates to the front end tool. Um, so here we have a screenshot of our electronic sign out tool, which is typically used by clinicians. And if you'll notice here, the screenshot has a column for chart watch. So once again, the third column from the right, you'll notice there is a chart watch column and this contains uh, the chart watch risk groups. And in this case, the risk groups have been color coded. So a uh, high risk group color coded as red, uh, low risk group as green and the medium risk group as yellow. So we're following the um, traffic light system in this case. And then finally, the last method of delivery is alerts that are sent to phones. Um, so for patients that are flagged as high risk, uh, we actually sent out an alert to uh, clinician phones to let them know that the patient is at a high risk of deterioration. Um, so, yeah, so going through the different um, methods of delivery, um, really they're, they're varying a level of urgency uh, based off the end users that they're going to and based off um, the information that's being communicated. Um, and you can read more about it in these links below. Um, the slides will be available to share and you'll be able to access these links. And also at the very end, uh, I have, um, I'll have slides with like all of the links, resources and papers that I share throughout the talk. Okay, so uh, I've gone over chart watch, um, but I have this slide just to really pause, take a step back and reflect on how we got from where we were to where we are now. So okay, I should have probably titled this slide back to the past because we are going to the past. Um, so just to give a bit of context, um, this is where things were at before. So before we had scripts that are running from one person's laptop, um, it works, but lots of ways in which this can fail. So, you know, what if this person is sick? What if they go on vacation? Um, most of the laptops we use are Windows laptops. What if we get that uh, Windows update? You know, like the laptop will be out for a while. Um, we have no logging, we have no development environments. That's how things are before. Now, where things are at now, well, you know, things are much better. We have service accounts. So basically this removes the reliance on one person. Um, we log all the things. We have staging versus production environments and so much more. So how do we get from before to now? I'd say really it's a combination of hard work, trial and error, lots of talking, uh, talking to the right people, figuring out what works and also what doesn't work. Um, and I'd say out of all the tools and findings, I think we can summarize them into two categories. So we have the tools for development and also the tools for deployment. Uh, so let's dive right in. What do you need for development? So the first thing that we need for development is really connection to databases. Um, so within the hospital, there are various data systems. So for example, we have a different system for labs, a different one for surgical procedures and so on. Um, so in order to help the data science team work better, we uh, developed a package called a uh, ChartDB. Um, so ChartDB is an internal R package to interact with hospital databases. And um, with regards to connecting to databases, we wrote a bunch of connection functions and they all follow the same pattern. So for example, if I want to connect to database A, I just need to give us input my username and my password. If I want to connect to database B, I also give us input my username and my password. And if I want to connect to uh, the hospital's enterprise data warehouse, or rather the EDW, I would give, as you expect, my username and my password as input to the function. So internally, this is actually what's happening. So internally, uh, we have a bunch of retries because you know the connection may not work the very first time. Uh, we also have a bunch of checks. So making sure that um, the connection is successful and that what's being returned is uh, what you expect. So ChartDB offers uh, 
connection functions, and it also offers other utility functions. Uh, so for example, I have this get patient ADT function right here. Uh, and what ADT stands for is admit discharge transfer. Um, so basically when I call this function, it will return a list of uh, patient uh, movement events. So I have a row of when the patient first gets admitted to the hospital, when they transfer, for example, from the emergency department to uh, a medical ward, and then when they get transferred. And you know, knowing where a patient is located in the hospital is pretty useful in nearly all of our projects. All right, so we have database connections. Um, another thing that we need for our development is an environment that lets multiple people collaborate projects a really uh, reproducible development environment. So in order to help with that, we ended up using uh, RNs. Um, here I have a link to RNs, and, and here's a screenshot of the documentation. Um, as I said before, uh, at the end, uh, all of the links will be included um, in the slides. Um, so RNs is an R package for R dependency management. And how we use it in our project. Well, here's an example of our project structure. So, you know, we have our main folder, we have a bunch of uh, files, a bunch of subfolders. And really, I want to bring attention to that last file at the end, which is the rn.log file, which is where um, all of the rn magic happens. So, this is what the rn.log file looks like. And basically what it does is it specifies the different packages that your project relies on, as well as the different package versions. Um, so for example, here, uh, my project relies on dplyr, and I'm using version 1.0.7. Um, so you know, I could then give this rm.log file to a teammate, uh, and then they can uh, then ensure that they're downloading the same packages as well as the same package versions to uh, contribute uh, on the project. Okay, so we've highlighted a few things for development. So I have my database connections, I have um, my reproducible environment, which is facilitated through RNs. Another thing that I need is functions and utilities that you reuse. So really what I mean by that is package-based development. So here uh, I have a link to the R packages textbook, as well as a screenshot of um, documentation, highly recommend it. Um, so really, why write a package? Um, there are a bunch of reasons, but I'd say that for us specifically, what we found the most relevant was uh, being able to share code and knowledge with others, um, as well as uh, having no more copy pasting. So I find that as I'm developing, if I'm copy pasting the same bit of code over and over, kind of like, you know, it, it rings an alarm. You're like, maybe I should take a step back and think of what I'm doing. Um, so if we revisit the project structure that I introduced a few slides ago, um, this R subfolder right here is where you would have all of your uh, package functions. And then there is the description file right here, which is um, where you would define the attributes of your package. Uh, so for example, this is the description file that I have for ChartWatch. Um, so you know, it's listing out a bunch of attributes like the package name right here, so it's ChartWatch. Uh, the package version, 1.11.10. And at the very end, I have uh, the imports right here, which specifies uh, the packages that my package relies on, so the dependencies. OK, so our development uh, checklist is um, we're adding more to it. So we have our database connections. We have an uh, environment that allows multiple people to collaborate. We have package-based development. Uh, another thing I'm going to add is environments, environments, environments. So the reason I say the same word three times is because we actually work with three different environments. We have the development environment, the staging environment, and the production environment. So the development environment, um, this could be your local computer. Uh, but in our cases, uh, we usually use a development server. Um, so what our development server includes is GPUs, which allow for you know, any projects that uh, require deep learning. Um, and also, uh, the development server works nicely with ChartDB. Um, so that means that anyone who uh, wants to develop something, you know, they're guaranteed that uh, database connections will work for them. So they'll be able to access uh, the data that they need for their projects. 
Uh, next, you have the staging environment, which is as close to the real deployment environment as possible. Uh, so for example, when we need to make updates to ChartWatch, we would first deploy to the staging environment to make sure everything is working as we expect it. Uh, and then finally, there's a production environment, which is where things actually get deployed. All right, so things I need for development. Um, the last thing I added was a thing about environments. Briefly talk about the production environment, which I think segues nicely into the next point, which is what do you need for deployment? So actually, before I dive in, I'm just going to take a small intermission so I can reflect a bit on ChartWatch's deployment. So ChartWatch was deployed on August 2020, um, but it's actually first silently deployed in November 2019. And I guess the reason for this large gap is because um, initially ChartWatch was supposed to go live in early 2020, uh, but then the pandemic happened, it affected plans, um, the hospital's priorities shifted at that point, you know, they wanted to focus on uh, containing um, um, the rising number of COVID cases in the hospital, uh, and then the you know, charge kind of like took a, a bit of a backseat. So yeah, it was first finally deployed in November 2019, and this is actually here a screenshot of what the uh, ChartWatch repository looked like back then in November 2019. So the very first time we tried to deploy it. Um, I guess a few interesting interesting things that I want to highlight here. Uh, so first of all, there are two folders that start with zero zero. Interesting. Oh. Chloe warned me that this might happen. Don't worry, they are testing. <laughs> it's not a real fire. <laughs> um, Chloe, I mentioned I could fill the time if that happened. I'm not sure how long the <laughs> fire alarms will go off, but um, I did just want to remind people that you can ask questions if you're watching on YouTube live, or you can also use the Slido link, which I will show on the screen for us as well. I see that there's two questions over there now, so I can read them out for you, Chloe, so that they can be <laughs> top of mind as well. I think you might be covering this in just a second here, but uh, one of the questions over there was, can you talk more about the development process uh, for this? What came first? Were there steps dependent or parallel? Uh, or did these changes happen simultaneously? And if the alarm's still going off, no worries. We can cover it <laughs> later. Okay, it's still going off. Well, I will use... Okay, awesome. I will use the time to also just let you know, um, I usually share this at the end of the event, but I saw somebody ask a question about it as well. So if you are interested in figuring out where to find upcoming events, um, I created a, this is actually a Cordo doc here <laughs> that is published to our Connect instance, but it has a nice calendar where you can see everything that's happening in the next a uh, few months. So the meetups that happen on Tuesdays, but also data science hangouts that happen every Thursday at noon Eastern time. And so this Thursday, we have Eric Nance joining us from Eli Lilly as our featured leader for the week. So at the data science hangouts, I'm curious if anybody listening in has been to one, maybe comment in the chat. <laughs> um, but it, there's a different data science leader that joins us every week and just answers questions from you all. So maybe you have questions about how they're thinking about hiring or how they're structuring their team or about different technologies that they use. There's no presentations at the Thursday events. It's all just kind of open conversation among everybody and, and lots of questions. So definitely recommend joining one of those too. And I see Libby says, yay, Eric. Yes, I'm really excited for Eric to join us this Thursday as well. 
How are we doing, Chloe, on the alarm? <laughs> I think it should be okay. <laughs> okay. Um, if ever comes back, I'll go back on mute. Um, I saw there was a comment about, like, is that smoke behind you? Um, no, but it might be snow because it's snowing outside. So maybe that's what's <laughs> behind me. And I see I just mentioned the um, the community events and I showed the link on the screen, but I also just copied it over to the chat if you want to um, check that out there, too. But I will hand it back over to you, Chloe. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right. Where was I? All right. So, I mean, it's funny that the alarm happened during the pause story time period. Um, yeah. So I think you were going over. Um, this is what. So there, yeah, this is what the uh, repository structure looked like when you first tried to deploy it. And I was just pointing out a few interesting things about that. Uh, so just to recap, um, there are two folders that start with 00, zero. interesting. Um, at the very bottom, there is that error check.py file. So you know there is Python code here. Um, and then also I have my .rproj file at the very bottom. So there is R code. Um, and actually, if you look at each of these different subfolders, you'll find you know a mixture of R, a mixture of Python. I believe we also had some Java code at that point. Um, oh, sorry, I thought I had the alarm. <laughs> I think we're I think we're at almost at the end. I think there's some saying that it was still testing. <laughs> Okay. Awesome. Bear with us yeah. here. Just a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's try. <laughs> I think it should be over. I don't. I can't hear it. In, if okay. it's in the background. Yeah. Okay. One second. I think it should be okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just continue and we'll see what happens. Um, oh no, I hear it again. Okay. Let's see. We could take a few more questions from people too. Any questions for me? Let's see. This is really scary, here, but I can, I can, uh, chat for a little bit as well while we're waiting. How about any any ideas for for meetups or things that you'd really like to learn a little bit more about as well in the future? We're starting to think ahead for 2023, so I'd love to hear from you all. Feel free to put some suggestions into the chat. I also can go ahead and make a poll over on Slido right now too. Uh, I'm going to say any suggestions for meetups in 2023, what would you like to learn? Okay, I just launched that poll over on Slido. Ooh, yes, Libby, I think supply chain topic would be great as well. And yes, thanks, Rebecca. We can all use a pause sometime. Can every everybody can stretch, get up, get some water. Oh, Marlene, that's a great suggestion too. How organizations are using new packages. I was also talking with a team uh, recently who was talking about like creating their own company wide tidyverse packages. So like, or like in a sense, tidyverse, but packages that are important for their company and like company branding too, which was cool. Any other meetup suggestions? I know there was a ton of interest in the people analytics topic from last week too. So I was just talking with a few people um, from the people analytics space about some future events for that as well. Oh, and yeah, Jake, thank you. Yeah, suggestion on packaging app content with Golem as well. Yeah, on the topic of incorporating branding, I see Marlene, you just put it into the chat. I was curious if 
people do have packages at their own, like your own internal packages that include your company branding. Is that something common? And feel free to put everything into the chat. Just a reminder, like the chat is great for questions, but also to like share resources and links with each other as well. Chloe, how are we doing on the alarm? <laughs> I think it should be good, but also I said that last time. Um, let's see what happens. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just try yelling, see if you can hear me over the alarm. Um, yeah. So... Uh, actually, uh, just want to address, like, there were some really great, great points uh, in the chat. I really like what you guys are saying about branding. Um, so that's kind of like one of the things that we try to do with our, uh, you like our chart DB package. Um, yeah, definitely like that. Um, so yeah, uh, going back to how things were before. Uh, so when we first tried to deploy ChartWatch, we had a mixture of Python and R scripts and also uh, some Java. And the way we were running everything is we had this complicated uh, thing. Whoops, let me see if I can share. Uh, sorry, oh, sorry, there's a bit of lag in my slides being updated. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, the way things were running is we had a mixture of Python and R scripts, and we had this uh, cron job which was calling different bash scripts, which was then calling different Python and R scripts. Um, and then I guess where we were, the biggest red flag is that our test environment was our staging environment, which was our production environment. So for example, in ChartWatch, one of our outputs was um, an email, which contained a list of patients with their risk group. And you can imagine, like, as I'm developing this, I would send that email to my my uh, my email and, you know, make sure things look as they should be. But because our test environment was our staging environment, was our production environment, uh, when it came time to silently deploy, I would have to, like, comment out the line that had my email and then set it to be, you know, whatever test email we had. And presumably when we would move to production, I would then comment out that one line and set it to, like, the end user's email. So, you know, like if, if I'm very diligent, if I'm very careful, things will work out. But this method is very prone to errors. So with that being said, um, oh, are my slides not updating? Let me, oh yeah. Um, so, so with that being said, what are the things that you need for deployment? So the first thing that we really need for deployment is authentication. Um, so all of our deployed applications run on our Zero Connect, uh, which is actually now Posit Connect. Um, so one of the nice things about Posit Connect is that it interacts with the hospital's Active Directory. Um, so what this means is that users can authenticate using their hospital username and password. So for the developer, you know, we don't need to keep track of an extra server username and password. And then for the end users, in order to access applications, they could just log in with their hospital credentials. And a nice thing about um, uh, being able to interact with Active Directory is that we can just use the existing groups to manage permissions. Uh, so for example, if I have an application that I, I only want to give access to uh, the SAA, so like the data science group, I could just use the existing Active Directory group to enable that. Uh, the other thing that RCO Connect, rather Posit Connect, allows us to do is to schedule scripts. Um, so we run our applications from service accounts, uh, which is basically a, a non-user account um, in which we can run automated services. And it's this combination of automatic scheduling and using a service account that uh, really makes us that deployments don't rely on one person. So, you know, this is how things were before. We had this uh, cron job, which would call different bash scripts, which would then call different Python or R scripts. Uh, but now that we're using um, our, sorry, now we're using Posit Connect, um, you know, there's a, we, we can leverage a lot of different things. Um, sorry, the, the screenshot is a bit small, so I listed all the different things, all the different tabs on the side. 
Um, so, you know, we have the application information, we have the access tab, which is what we use to uh, specify, uh, for example, who can access a specific dashboard. Um, we have the runtime settings, we have the scheduling settings. Um, so scheduling settings is what we use to uh, schedule our scripts. And then there's uh, the tags uh, really for organizational purposes. So for example, all the chart watch scripts would get tagged as being chart watch, um, environment variables and logs. Okay, so we're adding a few things for deployment. We have authentication, we have scheduling. Uh, another thing that's useful for deployment is being able to know when there's a downtime. So for example, here, this is a screenshot of one of our Slack channels where you know, we received an alert, um, you know, chart watch is down, for example. Um, so in order to enable this, uh, we created Jarvis, which is an R package for helping us monitor our production applications. Um, so Jarvis is um, the uh, Ironman's uh, robot assistant. Um, that's, that's where the packaging came from. Um, yeah, so we use Jarvis for uh, a few uh, notifications. So we can use it to send email alerts. So in this example here, you know, Jarvis sent email, uh, letting me know that there's an issue with the COVID dashboard. Um, as shown previously, we can use Jarvis to send Slack messages, so like here. And we also use Jarvis to check the health of systems that we depend on. Um, so for example, if you want to check a specific database, right, I can check that uh, my connection to the enterprise data warehouse still works. Um, and I can also check that I can access uh, different file systems with Jarvis. Uh, so on top of uh, using Jarvis for different notifications, we also developed a few downtime protocols, which are uh, pretty project specific. Um, so for example, with ChartWatch, if ever there's something that goes down, uh, we would send um, this kind of email to the hospital, to the, all the hospital users. Um, so we have a specific email template that we use here. Um, and this email template actually follows the one that IT uses. Um, so, you know, it's color coded at the top where, you know, red is for unplanned downtime, blue is for planned downtime and so on. Um, there's a, a list of things that we need to specify, uh, and this will go out to uh, all the hospital users. Um, so like not all projects will require something like this, uh, but something like ChartWatch, which is embedded into clinical care, does require something um, a bit more robust. Um, basically, like when, when things go down with ChartWatch, it's, just, it's not just the DSAA team that needs to be notified, it's other people within the hospital. All right, so you have authentication, scheduling, downtime. Um, I'd say another thing that you need for the deployment is um, a secure way to download internally developed packages. Um, I think I need to expand on this a bit more. So um, to give a bit of context, uh, around the holiday time last year, um, we started seeing these kinds of messages in our Slack channels. So, you know, like, not able to receive emails, you know, check log4j. Um, sorry, running late because I was on a meeting with IT because of log4j. Um, you know, if you use PyCharm, be careful, there's a log4j file in there. You know, I found log4j files in my VS Code folder. So there's something going on with log4j. Uh, so log4j, for those who don't know, it's a Java-based logging utility. And in December 2021, there was the log4j flaw. And basically what happened is this could allow malicious users to access internal networks. And I guess just to highlight uh, the severity of the log4j flaw, like here are some headlines that were coming out around that time. So log4j is a pervasive vulnerability, update your devices now. A hole in a popular piece of code is an open window for criminals. Um, the log4j software flaw is endemic, according to the cyber safety panel. So really, this, this whole thing about log4j is to motivate the next point, is that you know, we need to limit who can access the hospital network. And this is where something like Posit Package Manager comes in. Uh, so Posit Package Manager, also 
formerly uh, our serial package manager is a repository management server. And what it allows us to do is download packages while being disconnected from the internet. So if I go back to uh, our end, which I mentioned a few slides ago, um, remember we had our rm.log file, which specifies the different packages and versions. Um, so here uh, it specifies um, how the package is being downloaded. So instead of being downloaded from say GitHub or from CRAN, um, we're downloading from RSPM, which stands for RCO Package Manager, um, which is also a positive package manager. Um, yeah, so a few more things that we've added for deployment. So we just added a secure way to download internally developed packages. Um, one more thing I want to add is uh, an implementation plan. So, so far, all the things that we've discussed previously, um, I guess you can apply to data science in general. Uh, for this implementation plan, it's, it's a probably a bit more focus on the healthcare setting and on uh, deploying within the hospital. So just to recap uh, how Chartwatch is delivering predictions, um, they're going to different end users. So we have our emails that are going to charge nurses, the palliative care team. Uh, we're updating this electronic sign out front end tool that clinicians access. Um, we're sending alerts uh, whenever there's a patient that's flagged as high risk. This is going directly to clinician phones. And really, if you like just looking at the, the way things are um, delivered, there's a lot of people involved. So you have like your charge nurses, your palliative care team, you have IT, um, you have residents and physicians. And it's with that in mind that when we uh, um, when we came up with the, uh, when we put together the implementation team, we wanted to make sure that uh, people from all of these different end user groups were being represented and included in these implementation team meetings, right? So we made sure we had people from general internal medicine, from the intensive care unit, from palliative care, from clinical informatics, from IT, and then like from the data science team. Uh, just want to highlight that like collaboration is really important here. Um, and also the whole idea for Chartwatch actually came from a general internal medicine doctor. Uh, so they, they were the ones that are uh, leading the project uh, throughout the whole course and really making sure um, we were going from development all the way to deployment. Um, so one of the things that the implementation team was tasked with doing was uh, coming up with an intervention. So after Chartwatch flags a patient as being high risk, what happens then? Uh, so the implementation team develop a clinical workflow. Um, so this is what a clinical workflow looks like. I won't go into too much detail, but I will point out a few things. Um, so, you know, when a patient is flagged as being high risk by chart watch, there are a few things that need to happen after that. Uh, so one of them is, you know, placing orders to increase vital sign measurements, um, reviewing recent labs, reviewing recent medications and recent imaging orders. And really all the things that you find in this clinical workflow are all things that a clinician would normally do if they suspected a patient of deteriorating. Um, so when developing this uh, this checklist, this clinical workflow, it was really important to make sure that it wasn't disrupting any existing processes. Um, so, yeah, so you want to consider existing resources, you know, don't want to re-implement a workflow that already exists, for example. Um, and also the alerting notifications all fit within existing processes. So for example, when it came to the timing of emails, uh, so one of the emails that we sent out is sent to the charge nurse. And this email is sent out twice a day, and they're sent at a time that makes the most sense with how the shifts work. So once again, we don't want to uh, disrupt uh, kind of like how, how things are working currently. Uh, and yeah, with regards to the clinical pathway, um, really ensuring that there are time targets. So for example, after chart watch flags the patient as being high risk, uh, one of the things that the clinicians must do is uh, increased number of vital measurements within 24 hours of the alert being sent. So having this 24 hour time target makes it that uh, we can then go into the electronic health record and then measure the, whether or not this is happening. And of course, leaving room for clinical judgment. Um, so, yeah, so when working on the implementation plan, uh, we included a slide in deployment period. 
Uh, so basically, this is where your entire pipeline is running, but the, the final outputs are silent. Um, and this is useful for identifying bugs and addressing unexpected changes, um, such as change to how the troponin uh, lab test is done. Uh, so the troponin test is uh, one that's commonly used to diagnose heart attacks and other heart-related problems. Um, so during the deployment of um, ChartWatch, um, like the way this was measured got changed. And this is something that we had to address. So we had to address that in our data extraction code and also in our data processing code. Other changes that can happen can be due to deploying at the beginning of the pandemic. So, you know, during that time, there's lots of rooms that are being made available or unavailable based off, you know, the, the patients that are uh, testing positive for COVID. Uh, patients that are being moved to completely different units in the hospital just based on capacity. Uh, so this had to be addressed in our data extraction code. Uh, another thing that the sign deployment period was useful for was uh, for catching bugs. Uh, so this is a really interesting bug that we encountered. Um, I'm guessing that most people that are watching this talk are our users. Um, so, you know, I can ask the following question. How are missing values represented in R? I think most of you know, um, it's in R, missing values are represented uh, as MA, which means not available. Now, uh, next question is, what's the chemical element for sodium? I think some of you can see where this is going. So the chemical element for sodium is also MA. So we work in the hospital. Uh, in the hospital, there are blood tests that are done. Um, and you know, one of the things that gets measured in blood tests is sodium. So when we silently deployed ChartWatch, we noticed that there were no sodium tests that were being measured. Um, so this is an example. Uh, this is a, a graph that shows kind of like all the electrolyte counts. Um, so in blue is sodium. And if you notice here, the blue is set to zero. Um, we're like, OK, like this doesn't seem right. Like, what's going on? So when you went and checked the code, what we found was that uh, the R code that we were using to read some of the labs data was interpreting all of the sodium tests as being NA not available. So yeah, this is what happened. Um, the fix was actually pretty straightforward. It was just like updating one of the function parameters to not read uh, NA as not available. Uh, it was just a, a very interesting bug that we ran into. Um, so yeah, so once we were done with the uh, silent period, um, it's time to go live. Uh, so actually for us, we had a pilot phase in which we uh, first deployed to two general internal medicine teams only. Um, and during that time, we had weekly meetings, which were used to you know debug any issues we ran into, uh, go over the patients that were flagged by chart watch and you know, check like, does it make sense? Or is there anything weird or unexpected? Um, so that was the approach that we took uh, for uh, going live. We really did an, a, a phased approach. So start off with two teams and then deploy to the rest of the teams. And really throughout this whole process, so throughout pi the pilot phase, throughout solid deployment, throughout you know, developing the clinical workflow, uh, end user engagement is important. Um, this is not something that could have been possible with just a data science team. Um, when it came to developing the clinical pathway, we really relied on you know, the, G the general internal medicine team, on the palliative care team, on the nurses we were working with to uh, develop that pathway. And also when it came to developing education and training processes, that was once again a, a highly collaborative effort. So yeah, so things for deployment, uh, implementation plan, super important. Um, one last thing that I, will, that I will mention for deployment is uh, something about monitoring. Um, there's a question mark here because, you know, this could be a whole talk and we're already nearing the end of this talk. Uh, so we, it is a whole talk. There's plenty of other people that are spoken about monitoring. Um, so I would redirect you to watch uh, these amazing talks, um, lots of great insights. Um, with the time remaining, I will mention a few things specific to ChartWatch, though. 
Um, so with ChartWatch, one of the things that we want to look at is model performance. Um, but that's a bit hard to do once the model has been deployed. Uh, let me expand on that a bit more. Hmm. Somehow we got kicked out there, but here you are. <laughs> Am I still here? <laughs> it, was just for a, it was just for a second. Yep. Okay. All good? Yep, we're good. Okay. Um, so let me just backtrack a bit. So um, with ChartWatch, one of the things that we want to look at is model performance. Um, but that is difficult to do once the model has been deployed. Um, so clinicians, one of the things that they asked for was a target positive predictive value of 0 0.33. Uh, so what this means is that for every three alarms, at least one of them should be correct. Uh, but that is kind of hard to measure once you are deployed and in production. So what I mean by that is, let's say ChartWatch flags a patient as being high risk and sends out an alarm. And then that patient doesn't deteriorate. Like they don't transfer to the ICU, they don't die. Um, does that mean that the chart watch prediction was incorrect? Or does that mean that the chart watch prediction was correct? And then because clinicians received that alert, they were able to intervene and prevent that outcome from happening. So yeah, in deployment, we, we, we get into these cases where there are these uh, false alarms, which we're not sure if they're actually false alarms or if they're uh, averted outcomes just based off this uh, successful intervention. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, another thing that we measure in ChartWatch is the daily number of alerts. Um, so on average, we're sending two alerts per day, which is a, a reasonable number that the clinicians are happy with. Um, there are some days where there are no alerts and there are some days where there are lots of alerts. So for example, I think there's like nine or eight alerts uh, sometime uh, in like April or May. Um, so yeah, one of the things that uh, we were really uh, concerned with was make sure there weren't too many alerts. So we worked with the clinicians to ensure that we were minimizing alerts. So right now the way things work is that, you know, a patient will receive an alert if ChartWatch classifies them as being high risk. Uh, we added some additional rules on top of that, and those rules we develop with the help of the uh, end users. So, you know, we don't re-alert a patient unless it's been 48 hours since their previous alert. And, uh, you know, this just ensure that we're not alerting for the same patient every hour, for example. Um, and we added this additional rule, which is that we don't alert a patient if they just came from the intensive care unit. Um, because if a patient is coming from the ICU, you know, like the clinicians already know that um, they may not be doing too well. And it's expected that, you know, their vital measurements, their labs might be, uh, might be looking a little off because they just came from uh, intensive care. Um, the last thing I will say about monitoring is regarding clinical adherence. Um, so how do we know that when a, a patient receives a chart watch alert, um, the clinician is actually doing something and they're not just ignoring that alert? Um, so one of the things that we look at is the number of vitals that are measured after an alert is sent. Um, so we do that because um, as part of the clinical workflow, one of the things that the clinicians have to do when they receive a chart watch alert is increase the number of vital measurements. As this is something that we can easily measure just by looking at the electronic healthcare record, um, looking at the number of vitals that are sent uh, after an alert has been uh, sent. Um, I mean, it's um, it's not a perfect measure because the number of vitals can in, uh, increase for reasons unrelated to chart watch, uh, but it's a proxy uh, and it gives us a good enough idea of uh, a clinical adherence. Um, so, so this brings us towards the end of our talk. Um, so let me just summarize some of the things that we talked about. Um, so we looked at the different tools for development and deployment of an early warning system in the hospital. Um, so on the development side, the things that we found useful were you know, database connections, a reproducible environment facilitated uh, through our end, package-based development, um, the, the different development staging and production environments, and then on the deployment side, we had authentication and scheduling, which were uh, facilitated by Posit Connect. 
Uh, we had downtime protocols, uh, a secure way to download internally developed package, packages with the help of Positive Package Manager. Um, we had an implementation plan in which we're working with um, our different collaborators, our end users, and then we had uh, monitoring uh, at the very end. And you know, all of this uh, would not have been possible if it weren't for collaboration. Uh, I think it's something I keep saying throughout the talks that collaboration is really important. Um, developing and deploying chart watch in the hospital is not something that we could have done on our own. I was really by working with um, a, a great team and a lot of different people within the hospital that this was possible. Um, so, yeah, so this brings us to the end of how, uh, what I prepared. Um, and as I said before, the slides will be available. And at the end, I do have uh, the list of all the papers, uh, talks, blogs that I mentioned. You can all find them at the end. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chloe. I really love the, the storytelling through the slides, too, and all the, the images. <laughs> They're awesome. <laughs> there are a lot of questions that are coming through, um, both on Slido and through the chat. So I just want to remind, remind people, you can ask in the YouTube chat, um, as well as the Slido link, which I'll just put on the screen again here in a second. There we go. Awesome. So Chloe, I'd love to just dive into some of the, these questions, if, if that's okay with you. I, I'll jump over to Slido and see some of the most upvoted ones too. One from the, the beginning, which we touched on for a second is, can you talk more about the development process? What came first? Were there steps dependent or parallel? Or did these changes happen simultaneously? Um, a lot of things were happening at the same time. So uh, in the talk, I think I mostly focused on the implementation team and like all the things that the implementation team was doing to get this from development to deployment. Uh, but there were different sub teams that were working on this. So there was the uh, evaluation team, which was, you know, they were trying to address the question, like, how do we ensure that uh, the chart watch deployment is successful. So they're the ones that are coming up with like, uh, you know, we should measure vitals because you got to measure clinical adherence in one way or another. And there was uh, the modeling team, which is, you know, mostly the data science people and some of IT that are focused on actually building the model. Um, so different teams working all at once. Um, I see the way this all started was really from uh, uh, the general internal medicine doctor who came up with the idea first and, you know, came to the DSA team and said like, hey, like, it would be cool if we had an early warning system and then it's kind of like all uh, snowballed into this. Thank you. I see somebody else asked, and I guess this is a follow up here, but did the, the team come first or did you architect these workflows and then build the team? Um, so like the, the DSA team, or rather at that time we were the chart team, like we did have the chart team first. So we did have a data science team. I'd say like the, the different groups, like the implementation team is something that came as we uh, progressed, as we started uh, working towards uh, um, developing the tool. So we had all of the, the building blocks for us assembling it together that kind of happened a bit later. So on the topic of the team building, then, can you speak to any lessons learned from building four teams within DSAA? What did it take for leadership or management to take on a big scale project like ChartWatch? Yeah, that's a great question. So when we first started off, we did not have the four team structure. It was, we just had data scientists to do a bit of everything. Um, but we found that, you know, there were certain people who were a lot more knowledgeable in one aspect. Um, so I think it just made sense to split it up into this four different teams. Um, and then uh, with like within each of the teams, there is a, a director for each of these teams. I think it makes it a lot uh, like it, it makes the, the, the management and coordination a lot more streamlined. All right, so as a data scientist, I can focus on doing data science work. I don't need to think about like you know, all of the other unrelated things. Absolutely. And I see Rebecca asked a question over on YouTube. What is going on under the hood for those alerts that you showed us? Um, Rebecca just mentioned, like, how do you begin with either like 
functions for emailing or database status. Yeah, yeah. So I guess more specifically, when we're check when we're checking the database status, we are just checking that a uh, connection can be made. Um, so you know, I just try to connect using my usual connection function. If that doesn't work, then I know that something's going on. Uh, with regards to actually sending out the alerts, uh, for sending Slack alerts, um, we are working with a Slack API to send that. And then uh, for sending out emails, um, this is something you can do. Uh, um, there's a bunch of R packages for that actually. So the one we use is send mail R. Uh, so this is what we use to send out our emails. I was gonna go try and capture the the link to put in the chat, but it's hard to do both those <laughs> at one time. <laughs> um, I see Ed, Ezra also asked uh, over on YouTube, how early in a project do you typically shift to developing an R package? Oh, that's a good question. That's something that we sometimes struggle with because um, I guess you don't want to do it too early because it might seem like you're kind of like over engineering things. Um, so I think for us specifically is for chart watch, it was um, at like, so we first deployed in November 20, we first signed the point November 2019 and then everything was put on pause. And it was over the summer that we decided like, okay, let's just build this all as an R package. So I'd say by that time, like we had all of the requirements kind of like all nailed and we all knew like, you know, this is what the alerting schema would look like. This is what, the, the, these were the different groups that we would be like um, interacting with. Um, so I'd say like wait until you know what the final requirements would look like before shifting to developing an R package. Great, thank you. Um, I see Toyin just asked, how long did implementation planning take? Large stakeholder groups can be unwieldy. Yeah. Um, so the, the idea for Chartwatch, I believe it initially, uh, like the, 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 the idea initially started like back in 2018. Um, and yeah, like large stakeholder groups can be unwieldy. It's lots of uh, schedule managing and, you know, trying to find a time that works for everyone. Um, but I mean, I think this is one of the things that we, we want to make clear is like, if you want this to actually be the point implemented, you need to be committed to working towards, like you need to be able to show up to like, you know, our monthly meetings, our bi-weekly meetings. Um, so yeah, it was, it, it was hard, but we, we managed to get it working. And I think it was, uh, a lot of credit goes to the support team who was able to make all of these uh, meetings happen and ensure that, you know, like the project coordination um, actually like followed through with that. Thank you. I noticed that was a common question too. It looked like somebody had else had asked that as well. So thank you. Um, jumping back over to slide, actually somebody asked this, so I think over on LinkedIn. How does DSAA fit into the overall organizational structure? Uh, so we are directly part of the hospital. Um, so um, yeah, like I, I guess when we started off, we were a bit more research based, but then um, I think it was in 2019 or 2020, we officially became part of the hospital. So, you know, like uh, advanced analytics is a priority for the hospital. Thank you. I know a little bit ago you were mentioning like the idea for chart watch came from uh, one of the, the clinicians and I'm trying to find the question that I copied over here, <laughs> but I can, I can read it first. Oh, here it is. Mark asked, in what way are clinicians involved in the development process? Like, how do you prioritize what you work on as a team? Yeah, so clinicians are completely involved. Uh, they're involved from day one. Um, our, our project intake model is very clinician driven. So it's, it's not the DSAA group that comes up with the ideas. It's the end user that comes to us with an idea and then we work together. So in this case, we had uh, Dr. Amol Verma who came to us. So like, hey, I want to develop an early warning system. Let's work together um, into doing that. Um, so yeah, clinicians are involved from day one. I'm throwing a ton of questions at you here. <laughs> if you need to take All a good. sip of water. <laughs> keep, keep them coming. Uh, okay. Um, another question 
was how did you succeed in gaining the confidence of decision makers in the application? Uh, I think for this is um, also we we leverage um, the the clinicians we were working with. So Amol was really useful in you know talking to uh, the clinicians and you know telling them like hey like the chart watch model is something that is reliable that works. Um, I think that also the uh, education piece was useful in uh, education and training. So it was useful in uh, getting the different end users accustomed and used to ChartWatch. Um, and also when we first deployed, um, we did have regular meetings. So it was a good way to kind of get like a, like a vibe check, make sure like, hey, like how are things going? Like are people still like receptive to that? Uh, so just checking in regularly and ensuring that you know, everyone was happy with how things are going. Awesome. I see another question, and I might need help with an acronym here. How do you deal with the medical device regulation um, if applications, for example, ChartWatch, fall under the category of SAMD? Yeah. Uh, um, so I believe ChartWatch doesn't actually count as a medical device. So the way that we deploy this was all under the umbrella of quality improvement. Um, so yes, I know that when we we had to write a few like uh, uh, yeah we have to write a bunch of documentation that I always fell under quality improvement. Uh, yeah, that is a really good question. Thank you. Um, a question I had, and let me just double check. There are other questions that I missed. Oh, and thank you, Mark, for clarifying in the chat. SAMD equals software as a medical device. Thanks. Um, a question that I had is if somebody maybe works in a hospital today and is inspired by the talk that you gave and is thinking like, I want to get started and I want to do this at our hospitals, is there any advice that maybe wasn't mentioned in the presentation that you would give people for getting started or what you wish you knew ahead of time? Ooh, good question. Um reach out to other people that are doing this in the field. Uh, so I think just talk to other groups and figure out like what worked, but also what didn't work was really good for us. Cause we know like, okay, like this didn't work. Let's not explore that. Um, but, like talk to the end users, right? Talk to the doctors and nurses. What are things that they like? What are things that they don't like? What are things that they want? Um, Cause at the end of the day, they are the ones who are going to be using this tool. Um, so you don't want to, you don't want to waste your time building something that no one will use, right? So I'd say really talking to your end users um, will be really useful to uh, a successful deployment. Thank you very much. I see there was a question earlier I had missed um, around Python support. And I was curious if your team is using this tool with both R and Python. I think you mentioned a few Python users too. Yeah, so when we first, our very first deployment was a mixture of Python, R, and uh, Java. Um, when we redeploy, we ended up actually cutting it down to, we went to like streamline it a bit. So the, um, the, the latest version of uh, ChartWatch is actually only R based. Yeah, but yeah, our team is, has a mixture of Python and R users. I want to double check from the chat that there aren't questions that. I have missed, but just a follow up from my question, Chloe, um, about like what you would have wished you knew and you said reach out to other people. How did you go through that, that process of like identifying who else you should reach out to or other teams so you can learn what they did before? Uh, so I, think, uh, I think I'm very lucky in that. Um... Uh, Mohammed Mamdani, who is the kind of the VP who was uh, who led the project from beginning to end, he's very well connected. Uh, so he knew a lot of people. He knew a lot of people on like more on the application side, but also on the research side. Um, so he was able to reach out to them and set up these meetings. And that's how we were able to um, have all these these discussions that really helped to uh, kind of like where we are now. Yeah. So I'd say yeah, really just reach out to your network. Um, yeah. I always like to say this too, and sometimes I forget, but if you do want to connect with people and you're listening in on the chat, if you want to share your LinkedIn, oh, I realize I shared it from the posit <laughs> account instead of my own, but 
Um, if you want to share your LinkedIn to connect with each other, I know there's a lot of people here listening in who are doing similar things as well. So I'd love to just use the opportunity to be able to help connect people as well. If you're looking to get started and you don't know who to reach out to, feel free to connect with me too. And I can try and connect you with others in, in the space as well. Let me just double check once more. I think we have gone through all the questions. Thank you so much, Chloe, for an amazing presentation. Really, really appreciate your time and answering all these questions. If people do want to get in touch with you, is the best way LinkedIn or where? Oh, yeah, feel, yeah. Um, feel free to add me on LinkedIn. Um, specify that you're from the talk. Uh, always love to meet people that you know have an interest in healthcare and data science. Um, also, I, I think in the slides that I link to uh, our team website and also our team blog. Um, so feel free to check that out. There's some cool things that we write about there. That's great. Thank you all so much for joining us. And as I mentioned in the beginning, the recording will be available at the same YouTube live link. But I'm also going to go in right now and add timestamps from the Q&A and then some of the helpful resources that Chloe mentioned too. I'll put in the details with the recording. Thank you all so much for joining. Thank you, Chloe. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.